No, I mean, Cabin Fever 2, I don't want to direct it. No, I'll take you to produce it, but it's fine. I don't want to set it in a cabin. No, it's, it's stupid. No, I think it's fine. Look, if they want to give me the birth, could you not touch me? No, because there's just no point for me to direct it. It's like, that's all I'll ever do. That's all I'll ever be is Cabin Fever, man. Well, fine. Can you give me a meeting on that? If you can get me a meeting on the next Olsen Twins film, I'll do it. I want to... I'm sorry. Oh, hey. Hey, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Eli Roth, a lot of people say fuck film school and take that money and make your own damn movie. What's your sense of film school? I think that film school is a great, great place to fail. Film school provides an environment where you can fail and you fail with other people who are also failing. So if you can look at it where you're not going to go and shoot your masterpiece in film school, but you're really going to try stuff out, really experiment, and really fail in a way that doesn't hurt you professionally, then that's, that's how film school can be most effective. So I think that, yes, you can do it. You, there are Kevin Smiths, Quentin Tarantinos. I mean, you do not have to go to film school. It's not a law, but it's a great way to just try stuff out and see what you're good at. What do you do after film school? The best advice I can have to give to anyone who wants to work as a film director is to work on movie sets. Um, when I was in college, I worked for Freon Movies uh, for four years. I did assistant editing. I was in art department, running couches up and downstairs. I was a PA. And after I graduated and I had my Student Academy Award, I was on the street stopping traffic and running and getting coffee for people. You have to get on as many sets as you can and learn what it's like to be on a movie set. Learn the set language, how does it work, and you kind of see how long it takes to get one sequence, how long it takes to get a shot, and you watch other people fuck up. And you watch what happens when they don't rehearse, you watch what happens when ADs scream instead of communicating, and you watch what happens when a director's not prepared. Um, and then you work, you know, I'd worked on, you know, $100 million movies where the director was indecisive, and you just watch it trickle down through the production, and then I worked on kind of short films with David Lynch directing, and it was just really easy going, and he was really cool and really supportive, and he got great stuff. So, um, you know, I think the best, a lot of people think, well, you know, you learn everything you learn from being a production assistant in two weeks, and yeah, you do. Like, once you're on a set for a week, you know what to do, but you just sit there, and you learn what it feels like to be up at 4.30 in the morning and getting bed at 11.30 and not really eating in like five minutes, stuffing down your food and trying to, and that's what making a movie is. It's not having a vision and going and executing it and working with the actors. That's like 2% of it. It's like this asshole's yelling, some guy won't move his car, the camera's fucked up, you're losing the light, there's people flashing pictures that are fucking up the exposure. I mean, that's, and it's your job to just kind of, you know, see how do you deal with all this chaos. I was on movie sets for 10 years before I made Cabin Fever. So when, you know, glass exploded in an actor's eye, we had an ambulance there. When shit went wrong and someone got a black eye, well, you shoot him this way and let's rewrite the scene. I mean, I had just been around so many shoots where, like, catastrophes happened that when a catastrophe did happen, I knew how to handle it. Well, Eli Roth, what... When you go to heaven, who are the three people you'd like to bring to heaven with you? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we inside I, I apologize. the studio. Inside uh, the trauma yeah, studio. Inside the asshole studio. The asshole um, studio. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, how did you get the money to make Cabin Fever? Well, I wrote Cabin Fever with Randy Pearlstein, and we finished the first draft in 1995. And just went up to a whole series of investors, went to every studio, smaller companies, places like Troma. And uh, there were a lot of people that I found in, this when I was living in New York, you find like a lot of dentists and businessmen that are like, oh yeah, I want to get into movies now. They're kind of looking for movies to put money into. And I think that a lot of them seem to like the idea of putting money into movies. But when it actually comes time to write a check, uh, suddenly it seems like a terrible, terrible idea. And I couldn't get a dime for it. Nobody would finance it. So I moved to Los Angeles and I just kept at it. Just kept every single person I met, they'd say, okay, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, I have this project. It's this low-budget horror movie. You know, the financial model would be like Evil Dead or Blair Witch. And you'd finally, um, I had a friend of mine from film school uh, named Evan Ostrowski said, I know this woman, Lauren Mays, and she's produced about 10 movies, really like budgets from $200,000 to a million dollars, that kind of range. And she read the script and she really liked it. And she said, I know this investor named Sam Fralick out of North, Sam Fralick out of North Carolina. And we went down and met with Sam and Sam said, well, I'll, come on as a producer if we can use my production facilities and we just 
basically started, got the ball rolling, and two days before shooting, three days before shooting, uh, an investor that had committed half a million dollars pulled out, these dentists. And so we just kept shooting, and Sam kept putting more money, and we were all, like, I was raising money between setups, calling, like, Aunt Gladys has $5,000, we can buy film stock. I mean, every day we didn't know if we were going to shoot the next day, and we really kind of made it on credit cards, but each day was like a victory. We got footage in the can. Then the union shut us down and took all of our money. They, yeah, they, uh, how, how did they shut you down? You'll find when you're making a film that as soon as people see you near a camera, they instantly think it's a hundred million dollars, like you just have billions and billions of dollars. They don't know that like you're scraping it together with grandma's money and renting a camera and it's your one shot, but they don't care. And they go around to different crew members every night in their hotel rooms. Like five guys from Brooklyn showed up. They drove down to North Carolina and they'd knock on the door of like the 22 year old grip. They go to the youngest, kind of weakest links in the chain. And they go, if you don't sign this fucking union card, you'll never get in the fucking union. And then they go to the union guys. They go, now you're in the union, you better sign this thing or we'll kick you out of the fucking union. Then they come to the producers and they go, look, the majority of your crew, we have 51%, you want to turn it union and we can now say that we're going to walk out or you have to put $100,000 in a bank account by 9 a.m. tomorrow. I think at that time we had $17,000 in our bank account. So my father, who's a doctor, who does all right, but he's not rich, uh, sold his stocks, took money out of his retirement. He took his retirement money to bail us out from the union. And then I was really, really stressed because you know, my dad's like, you know, he, I don't want him working until he's 100. You know, he's in his 60s now. So it's really, it was really a lot of pressure. But basically, we got enough footage to cut together most of the movie. And we came back to L.A. The George Folsey, the editor who'd been John Landis's partner, was extremely helpful in getting us. He told an editing house, look, let these guys have an Avid. Do it for deferred pay, maybe a little back end. And, you know, Eli's a good guy. At this, I really believe in this film. So because of George, we, they, they agreed to let us do it. It was really, so you really need to pull every favor. We were cutting, taking turns, not paying our rent so we could pay our editor. It was Ryan Folsey, George's son. We had a free avid and we basically cut together a 10 minute show reel. It wasn't really a trailer. It's just like kind of all the guts and gore lined up to, to take around to a new round of investors. So I called every single person I knew and finally had these, was um, my former agent, this guy Jamie Waldron, who I'm still very friendly with. Um, He's a producer now. He said, I know these guys. This guy Jeff Hoffman has this new company and they're looking for movies to invest in. So we, we played him the 10 minute tape and he read the script and just watching the 10 minutes of footage, you know, I cut music from The Shining and just like the leg shaving, the blood and guts. He's like, I get this. Um, and, uh, you know, then he, he invested the next chunk of $350,000. And then there was a group out of Connecticut. This, this, they call themselves Deer Path Films. They put another 400000 but. Even, it's like we got the 350 and then we were able to, we didn't complete the movie, so we shot two or three more days and then we got a cut. And basically, with the final group of investors, we had to show them a finished film. I had to show them the final avid cut with all the temp sound. Before, and then they showed that to their kids and the kids were like, yeah, it's better than American Pie. So essentially, it's like you do all this work, spend seven years making the movie, and it's like a, your movie's in the hands of like a 12-year-old kid. And thankfully, they made the right choice. <laughs> what, what, if you don't mind divulging it. What, what do you suppose all in? What was the budget on Cabin Fever? The all in negative cost of Cabin Fever was $1.5 million. That was taken. Um, I never got paid. My producers never got paid. It was deferred all of our salaries. With the deferments, we had about $400,000 in deferments. So it was like one9 But to date, um, to date, the film has grossed worldwide with home video and theatrical close to $100 million. And it still has not yet opened in Germany, France, or Japan. A lot of territories left. Yeah, I mean, God forbid I see any of that. It goes all to the distributors. But you know what? you got to know that going in. Understand that if your movie's a big hit and makes a lot of money, be lucky if you get your salary and just be happy that you got the exposure and that it got out there. Did your investors uh, make money? Everybody did. What was really great was because the negative cost was so low, we sold it for $3.5 million at the Toronto Film Festival. So right off the bat, the investors made their money back. And the way it works is like investors get their money back, plus you know, either 15 or 20 percent, depending on what deal you make, and then it gets split 55th, then deferments, then investors and producers. So The best training I ever had for being a film director were the three years that I spent as a camp counselor at Meadowbrook Day Camp, when I had a group of a whole bunch of 10, 11 year old boys, and that's, that's what directing is. It's like, I know he got two cookies, and you only got one, but you know what? I'm going to get you a cookie. I'm going to get you a better cookie than the one he got. And I know it's your chair, and I know there's someone sitting in your chair. But why don't you try sitting in that chair over there? Because that one's much more comfortable, and it'll be our little secret. Like, just the way you have to... I've realized that those skills of not losing your temper, saying, 
just focus on what's in front of the front of the camera. Um, those those skills really came into play more so than anything. Like things were going on, and you want to fucking strangle an actor, and you want to go, you idiot. You know, I spent years and years of this thing in my head. I broke my back to give you this part, to give you this opportunity, and you're on your fucking cell phone, and you want to leave early so you can go to a fucking strip club, which you've done for the last six nights, anyways. Fuck you, do the scene. You know, you want to just punch him out, but you have to go, hey, you know what? Let's just go and let's get it quick and, and let's try and make it there. You know, or whatever, whatever you have to do. I mean, did you find that? I mean, you've done far more films than I do. I don't know if it's that way for you. Well, I used to fight with the actors. I mean, I used to be more, I mean, there was enemies until uh, I did a little bit of acting myself, and then I realized there's a lot of pressure those guys are under. You know, it's uh, pretty stressful. So I, since then, I've been. Uh, Moderately friendly with him. Yeah, I think I've been actually very friendly with him. Yeah, I find you're very friendly whenever you're directing me on set. Well, you are you know, a very attractive young man. Oh, thank you. And Tales from the Crapper. So we, we talked a bit about the unions. You, you, that was ba the, what you said was basically the biggest problem, that they uh, basically took all your money. Yes. If you're making a movie, any movie, generally budgeted under, it used to be like $3 million, but now it's like half a million dollars the unions want a part of it. Generally what they'll do is they'll find out you're shooting. And like with us, it was a 24 day shoot. These fucking cocksuckers wait till day 12. So you've established your actors, established your locations. Think you on day one, it's like we shut down and leave. But when they hit you on day 12, you're fucked. Cause you're stuck there, you got your crew, like you can't. Another film I produced, 2001 Maniacs, they, they just came after us. And, and it's like, you sit there and you think, okay, Here's a million and a half dollar business opportunity that I've created where I had an idea and I had a project and I raised the money and I'm now pumping money into the local economy and I'm hiring crew people. It's independent money, starting a million and a half dollar company and spending it and they see a camera and they're like, you owe us this, you owe us that. And they come out and they go, you're trying to fuck us, you're trying to fuck us. We'll fucking shut you down. And that's what they do. They threaten the crew members. And they're these like mafia guys. There's nothing you can do about it. It's really fucked up. Is it, hold on a second. Is this here in Los Angeles or North Carolina? This is everywhere. This is on the East Coast. This is on the West Coast. That's why everyone's going to Canada. That's why everyone's leaving the country. The unions are so fucking stupid because instead of leaving the independent filmmakers alone, like saying, okay, let him do Cabin Fever, maybe Cabin Fever 2, when he has money, he'll come back and make that a union movie. Like, at least let him get the first one done. They fucking squeeze you and nickel and dime you, so you go, fuck it, we're going to Canada. And that's what we're doing on the sequel. We'll go to Canada, or we'll go to Romania or somewhere. That's why there's so much independent film production has left the country. These people are such idiots. They basically took every crew member and got them to sign up for the unions. There's no, non there's no more non-union crews, and they can't afford it. So it's like, fuck it, let's go to Romania. That's why people are shooting there, Lithuania. Lithuania Film Studios. You see, they have, like, you can pay people nothing. Mexico, that's why people are shooting these places. Well... New York, at least on our movies, they leave us alone. But like, maybe our budgets are so minute that they just have given up. They used to, the Teamsters, we used to get the Teamsters who'd come and, if we were outdoors in the street, they'd just come and stand in front of the cameras. But now I, I think they understand in New York that even though our production is not union, the lab, the sound house, the post-production are all uh, IA, and so they've been leaving us alone in New York. It's different. I mean, you're a New York fixture. And also, you know, there might be certain people in the film commissioner's office that might discourage the unions. But uh, No, she'd love to see, commissioner would like to see my legs broken. broken. Okay, well, I don't know about that. But it's like, you're, you know, they see you and they know what you're about. It's like, oh, there's Lloyd. He's doing his $250,000 trauma movie. This is his thing. He does it like, they know you. But it's like, for a guy like me, it's like, who the fuck is this guy? We'll teach him a lesson. You know, it's like, you've been there so long, you're like almost kind of grandfathered in from getting fucked with. Right. They know you, they like you, they respect you. These other guys, they're like, oh, let's see them. They, they see camera, they smell money. Let's fucking squeeze them for everything they got. It's sick. Yeah. It's stupid. They don't even realize how short-sighted it is. It's a happy story. It's a wonderful, happy story. But I wish someone had told me. I heard things, but I didn't. You don't know it until you go through it. But I just want people to know that this is what it's like. This is what happens. How about um, getting your movie? But, uh, did, what were the problems in g getting it in front of distributors? There was a very valuable lesson that I learned about having a sales agent. We had a terrific sales agent named Susan Jackson. And basically, say you make a film and you want to show it to Miramax. If you come up to them and say, hey, I want to see, show them, well, look at my movie, look at my movie, look, they're not going to look at your movie. They may, it may sit on a desk, it may sit somewhere, but if you have a sales agent, 
and the sales agent says, you got to see this movie, then all of a sudden they're like, well, wait a minute, we got to see this movie. Then they want to do it. So you pay a sales agent 10%. It's 10% of everything. Of everything that comes in, the sales agent gets 10%. This more money than me as like writer, director, producer is getting. It's like, fuck, but this is what you got to do. And then there's a foreign sales agent. So selling the movie to distributors, Susan Jackson, and this, she's a terrific job. No, like This is just the way it is. I'm not saying it's personally against her. Um, she's a company called Turtles Crossing, and she was on as our executive producer and sales agent. Now, just before, shortly before Toronto, uh, she had often worked with Cassie and Elways, who is a big sales agent at a William Morris Agency. And Cassie has had a string of massive sales. Like if somehow Cassie selling a movie, it's like, oh, this is theatrical. And Susan, Susan has a terrific reputation, but Cassie movies had hit big. So Cassie and Susan often partner on films. So they partnered on Cabin Fever. So now I'm going to a film festival, and I have two terrific sales agents who have excellent reputations. So now the distributors, Miramax, New Line, Revolution, they're going, all right, wait a minute. Susan and Cassian both want to sell this movie. We got to get in on this. And Harry Knowles at Ain't It Cool News was extremely, extremely, extremely helpful. We were out of, you know, like 400 films at the Toronto Film Festival. We were the dead last film. It was the festival ended at 8 o'clock Saturday. We were like Saturday midnight. We were the midnight movie. And I was worried that people go home after, you know, on a 12-day festival after day 7, a lot of people bail. So Harry wrote this great thing on the Internet because even the sales agents saying stuff, it's like if you have Internet buzz, distributors want to know, okay, is this movie going to get a good review from Anna Cool News? That's very important to them because it's like if it doesn't have stars or if it's an indie movie, it's like what kind of buzz is it going to get? That's going to get people in the theaters. It's going to get people excited. Harry wrote, I have, I have a feeling about Cabin Fever. This is the one everyone's going to be talking about. And it just started generating. So it's like you got to hit them from all sides. And we also hired a publicist, this company, MPRM, this guy, Mark Pogachevsky and Michael Lawson. Now, we were in Toronto, and MPRM publicity, they know Toronto inside and out. And he said, Who pays for all this stuff, like the publicist? We went to our investors, and we said to our investors, look, we got into Toronto. We have a chance to sell this movie. We need $15,000. We're going to spend $5,000 making DVDs with Cabin Fever trailers on them. And I cut four trailers, and I had a behind-the-scenes EPK. And, and we, the minimum run was 1000 So we had, right before the screening, we bombed every hotel. Everybody had these little DVDs. We brought the distributors. Susan brought them into the hotel room and showed them the Cabin Fever trailer. And they're like, whoa. And they were salivating to see this movie. They were like, what is this film? But the thing about it is a lot of people had videotapes, but somehow... Not a lot of people had the DVDs yet, and everybody had these cool little DVDs. They were all watching them on their laptops, and it was guts and blood and sick, these trailers that I had cut. And a lot was the same taglines, like, you know, Cabin Fever, Catch It. A lot of the you know, same teaser trailers that got used later on, they recut them in that style. Um, but they were very effective. So MPRM was terrific, because what at a festival, it's, nobody knows what movies are good. It's all buzz. It's all hype. And how do you get that buzz? How do you become that movie? Well, you pay for it. You hire a fucking publicist because the publicist will get your face in the newspaper. And I went out there, and I went to Toronto early, and they set up Premier Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, the Toronto paper. Uh, I did this, uh, this great journalist. This journalist, Barrett Hooper, is like the horror guy. He did this terrific piece on me, and they took really scary photos. So the day of the cabin fever screening, these people get their newspaper on the front of the art section. It's a massive photo of me going, scary movie guy, you know, <laughs> cabin boy. like. And then I did the interviews for local television. So these buyers are in their hotel rooms. They turn on the TV. Well, there's me, and there's clips of Cabin Fever. And it's just like they're hitting it from the Internet, hitting it from the sales, hitting it from the press. And now, as a buyer, the way it works is that, you know, if they get a videotape of their movie and they watch it, they're not going to bid on it. They're not going to buy it. Because if they buy it and it fails, then they'll get fired. But if they're sitting in a screening room and they see Miramax bidding on it and they see New Line, then they have to bid on it or they'll get fired for not having bid on it. So we were able to, through all the various sources, the producer, and this was like, Lauren Mays was like, we got to get a publicist. We got to get a sales agent. I mean, Lauren had been through other festivals before, so I didn't know this stuff. It was Lauren really kind of masterminded us. And I was like, well, if we're going to do that, then I'm going to, you know, hit the internet with Harry Knowles and the horror websites and the publicity, and they knew that they could put me in front of a camera and I could talk about horror. And we just, it just was like this whole sort of events colliding to get the film bought. Now, another factor that I didn't even consider was um, 
you know, while we were shooting the movie, I remember Lawrence, it was right after September 11th, and nobody was shooting anything. And Lawrence said, you know, if we're shooting now, a year from now, when we go to the festival, there's not going to be a lot of movies because nobody's really making a lot of product. And that's what happened. It was kind of a dead market. And I realized that if I'd been with the same movie at a different festival when Tadpole was bought or some of these other movies, they're kind of spent out. And they go, well, Cabin Fever's great, but I just, spent, I just wrote a $5 million check for this other movie. It's played before yours. Sorry. So there's really like a lot of luck, a lot of coincidence, a lot of timing. The marketplace was right. People were kind of ready for a violent R-rated horror movie. And what happened was we had the critic screening, the screen for critics and buyers, and 15 minutes into it, like we had an offer for England. And by the time the credits were up, I walked out and I got surrounded by it's that moment where it's like you always dream of that you're envisioning the editing room when you're starving and need $600,000 to finish the film. It's like all of a sudden it was like revolution, new line, Miramax. Everyone's going, we're buying it, we're buying it, we're buying it, Lionsgate. And the bidding war started. And because we had a publicist, the publicist had set up a party. So we're like, yeah, we'll see you guys at the party after. Well, that night we went to this restaurant and they're all there. And they're going up to the sales agents, to Cassian and Susan, and talking. And Miramax is watching New Line talk, and New Line's watching Revolution talk, and Revolution's watching Artisan talk, and Artisan's walking line. And everyone's just going crazy. And it's like, well, you gotta, you know, the bidding was just getting ridiculous. And that's how we were able to uh, close a great deal that guaranteed us, you know, Lionsgate really stepped up. And they said, look, we will guarantee. 12 million in PA, and that you'll be released on 2,000 screens. And they wound up releasing it on 2,100 screens. Um, but it, it took a lot. It wasn't like we just got into Toronto and showed up and it happened. Um, that it was, there was a battle plan. We met months before. We went to our investors. And now the next movie that I'd make, I would put publicity into the budget. I'd put, festival, put a line item for $20,000 in festival publicity and raise that. Because honestly, that's what you need. That, that's that's that little bit of money, not little bit, that money is what's going to really, really help sell your movie. When does the filmmaker actually get some moolah from his or her movie? Six months after closing the deal, you get the first check or something like that. It was some, something crazy like, and you know, closing the deal takes a long time. There's a lot of legal fees involved. So then boom, the first check for half a million comes in. Well, boom, let's take 10% off for sales fee. And then we got the money going to the lawyers and then this and that and then it goes to the investors and the investors have to wait till they make their money back so I said to the investors look guys I'm starving I have no I understand that it looks like I'm a big success but I have no money I'm in a zero bank account situation and that's what it's like you don't you do not get paid right away it's I'm telling you it really it's really, really, really difficult to make a living and pay your bills as an independent filmmaker, even in the best case, most successful scenario. When do you start to make the money? You don't. You really don't. I mean, uh, you know, basically to make a movie cheap, you have to give that farm away. You've got to split it up. And I'm like happy to share in, you know, the money with everybody for the people that really sacrifice for it. But it's really, it's tough. You, you generally don't. They, it's pretty much... Whatever they pay you up front is pretty much all you're going to get because proving to get that other back-end money is like, it's, it's like this impossible task. Any other points, to advice, information, or, or regrets that you care to talk about? Oh, I mean, I could have a whole DVD of uh, regrets. I think that, uh, honestly, no, I mean, there's not a lot of regrets. I mean, they're, the mistakes, the biggest, look, I've made plenty of mistakes. A lot of times when I've lost my temper, I got really frustrated or upset or angry at the wrong people about the wrong things. Um, I think a mistake I made was not moving out to Los Angeles sooner. And I think another mistake I made was only having Cabin Fever be my only script for a while. That the most successful person I went to film school with is Aaron Kruger, who wrote The Ring and Arlington Road and Scream 3. And Aaron wrote five scripts before he ever showed one to anyone. And I remember thinking at the time, that's really smart. And once he sold Arlington Road, everything sold, and he instantly became the hottest writer. And he's a terrific, terrific writer, but he was very smart about it. So I think that for people, just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. And you really have to have more than one project going. For certain things, to, you know, they heat up at certain times. I mean, you'll send it to an investor, and then you'll have to wait for two weeks. And you'll, like, go crazy just waiting. So if you have something else that you're writing it and working on, it's the best thing for your career. Because then if that first one goes, you'll need that second one ready. And do lots of drugs and stay out of school. Excellent. Excellent and, advice. And go to therottenfruit.com and support independent filmmakers who sell their DVDs over the Internet. Right on. Well, thank you, Eli. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I hope it's helpful. 
I, I hope that I want people to learn from my mistakes. Also, I think that people, I think that this industry is made into such a mystery that there's, especially with the digital age, that any, you know, we really all should be making our own damn movies. I agree. I think that uh, these are things that I wish I knew from the beginning. But, uh, I, I mean, seeing what Robert Rodriguez is doing with high def, where he's got his own green screen, his own cameras, he's shooting his own movies, editing his house, editing them, scoring them, just doing, shooting them himself, and having fun. That's what it's all about. It should be fun. And you know what? Honestly, it is. There's nothing more fun than shooting a horror movie, and there's nothing more fun than watching, and maybe equal to shooting the movie is watching people scream and uh, girls cry and people vomit. That's like the greatest feeling in the world. It is worth it. At the end of the day, it is absolutely worth it.